This is chapter nine, biotechnology. The humans have been using microbes in food production for thousands of years right, to make things like wine and bread. Um, but it was only just over a little over 100 years ago that scientists discovered that microbes were actually responsible for these processes. So this knowledge opened the door for using microbes to produce other important or beneficial products for our own purposes. So in this chapter, we'll look at some different tools and techniques used in research and development of these products. Biotechnology is the use of microbes, cells, or cell components to make a desirable product. So things like foods, right, wine, bread, cheese, um, yogurt, um, antibiotics, vitamins, vaccines, hormones, enzymes, etc. So the list could go on and on. So we essentially use these microbes as little factories to produce these chemicals and proteins for us um, that that organism wouldn't naturally make on its own, right, with its own protein synthesis, right, of its genetic code. So this is done by inserting, deleting, or modifying genes with recombinant DNA technology, also known as genetic engineering. So we can isolate a gene of interest, say the gene for insulin, and insert it or recombine it into a microbe genome. So now that microbe, undergoing its normal transcription and translation of its genetic code, will produce those insulin proteins for us. So remember from chapter 8 that DNA recombination can occur naturally in microbes. So we had conjugation, transformation, and transduction. But with biotechnology, we can take genes from animals, including humans, and insert those genes into the DNA of a microbe. Or we could take a gene from a virus and insert it into a cell like a yeast. So the recipient cell will then produce those proteins and express that gene, right, which may code for a useful product like insulin or antibiotics. We can also use recombinant DNA techniques to make thousands of copies of a DNA molecule. So this can help us generate sufficient quantities for various experiments and analysis. And it can also be used for identifying microbes that can't typically or easily be cultured in a lab setting, so things like viruses. So the primary tool of recombinant DNA technology is a vector. So a vector is a self-replicating DNA molecule, like a plasmid, that will transport or carry our foreign DNA into our recipient cell. So sometimes the word vector is used to refer to maybe insects like mosquitoes that can carry diseases, right? So they're a vector for that disease. So a vector is just something that's going to carry right, something else and deliver it somewhere. So vectors are usually plasmids from bacterial cells or viruses. The recombinant vector DNA can then be taken up by a cell where it can multiply and make copies of our recombined chromosome. The recipient cell is then grown to produce clones or genetically identical cells. Right, so remember bacteria reproduce by binary fission, so they should all be genetically identical. So we have, in this example, a gene extracted from a human cell for human growth hormone. Right? So a bacteria is not naturally going to produce human proteins and human hormones. So using some special enzymes, we snip our, ins our gene out. Right? Um, and then we also snip out an identical section from the plasmid. Right, so we took out this bacterial plasmid chromosome. So then our DNA fragment here has these sticky ends, these exposed DNA strands that can then base pair and insert into our bacterial plasmid. So now we have our recombinant or recombined DNA. We've combined the DNA from our bacteria and the DNA with our humans. So then we insert this plasmid into our recipient cell. So now this cell has the gene for human growth hormone. So we allow this cell to grow, right? We grow cultures in the laboratory, right? Within a few hours or a few days, we could have millions or billions of copies of these cells and this gene. Right? We can have all of these cells producing that product. So the final step in this procedure, this genetic modification procedure, is going to vary according to if our end target product is the gene itself. So maybe we just want to make a lot of copies of this gene 
right? So we don't want to have to make a thousand recombinant plasmids when we can just make one and let the bacteria do the work in copying it for us. Another option would be if our end goal product is the gene product itself, so the protein coded for by that gene. So in a previous example, it would be the human growth hormone. We can isolate this gene from our pure clone culture and insert it into another vector for introduction into another type of cell. So we can make copies of genes for pesticide resistance um, and then insert those genes into our plant cells. If the gene is expressed, meaning that it's transcribed and translated into protein, then that protein product can be harvested and used for a variety of purposes. So our example used human growth hormone, right, in E. coli. So before recombinant DNA technology, the only way to get human growth hormone was from humans, right? so i.e. human cadavers. So as you can imagine, this was very expensive, dangerous. Recombinant DNA technique just allows for much faster, cheaper, more pure production of these products. One of the most important tools of biotechnology is selection. So the law of natural selection just states that organisms with beneficial characteristics are more likely to survive and reproduce in their particular habitat. So in biotechnology, selection means artificial or human selection to select those desirable traits of animals or plants and now microbes that produce a desired product. Pretty much every modern fruit and vegetable and domesticated animal has been molded by the hand of human artificial selection. So natural selection is the environment, it's nature that's shaping and driving this evolution. So natural selection, a wolf, right, is going to be much more likely to survive in the wild on its own than our artificial selection pug. So, so this is showing a natural wild type banana. So it wouldn't be very good for us to eat with all of these seeds. It'd be kind of a pain to eat and spit out all those seeds. So through many generations of artificial human selection, right, we only allowed banana plants to grow that produce smaller and smaller seeds. Until now, they have virtually no seeds. And now basically all of our modern bananas are genetic clones. Mutations are another important tool of biotechnology because mutations are responsible for our biodiversity. And it's what helps drive evolution. So microbiologists discovered that they could create new microbe strains by exposing them to mutagens. Right? So remember those mutation generating substances. So using these mutagens, we can possibly trigger mutations that might result in a microbe with a more desirable trait. So they use this to increase the amount of penicillin produced by about a thousand times by the microbes. A site-directed mutagenesis is just where we have a specific targeted change in a gene. Restriction enzymes are another very important tool in biotechnology. Basically, the entire science of recombinant DNA technology is based off of the discovery of these restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are a special class of DNA cutting enzymes that exist in many bacteria. So these were discovered when certain bacteriophages or bacterial viruses um, were used to infect cells outside of their normal host range. The restriction enzymes in these new host cells destroyed almost all of that viral DNA. And they noticed that these enzymes only recognize and cut only specific sequences of DNA very consistently each time. This allows the bacteria to protect their own DNA from digestion or attack by the viruses. So it cuts this viral DNA into smaller non-infectious fragments. So there are hundreds of restriction enzymes currently known and each one produces a characteristic DNA fragment. Some restriction enzymes cut the DNA in the same place on both strands producing what's called a blunt end. Um, others will make staggered cuts and produce what are called sticky ends. So these are the ones that we can insert and recombine with other DNA fragments and chromosomes. So these sticky ended fragments are the most useful because they can be used to splice two different pieces of DNA together that were cut by the same restriction enzyme. 
So remember, restriction enzymes are very specific. They're always going to produce the same sequence of bases on their sticky ends. So through complementary base pairing, these sticky ends from different genes can now be spliced together. And finally, DNA ligase, the enzyme DNA ligase, is used to link these new fragments together and produce a new recombined DNA molecule. Also recall from chapter 8, um, we talked about DNA replication. That lagging strand produced those Okazaki fragments that were then tied together right, with ligatures by ligase. We said that vectors were used to carry new DNA into a cell for replication of our desired DNA sequence. Right, so they're the carriers that are going to deliver our new DNA to the new cells. In order for a vector to be useful, though, it has to be able to self-replicate. So if we go through all the trouble to insert this gene into our new recombinant plasmid and insert it into a cell, and then that cell dies, right, or these genes don't copy and pass on to the next generation of cells, then it's basically a dead end. Right? So these vectors have to be able to replicate and be passed from generation to generation of cells. Plasmids and viruses can both be used as vectors. Uh, plasmids are the primary vectors used because plasmid DNA can be cut with the same restriction enzymes as regular DNA. So this means all the pieces will have those same sticky ends and can be spliced together. Viruses can also be used as vectors. Um, they can sometimes accept larger pieces of DNA than a typical plasmid. After the DNA has been inserted into the viral vector, it can be cloned by the host cells. Polymerase chain reaction is a technique where we can increase small samples of DNA um, very quickly for analysis. So basically starting with just one gene, PCR can be used to make billions of copies in just a few hours. This technique is useful in rapid identification of pathogens where we don't have the time to wait for the cultures to grow in the laboratory. You can basically think of Polymerase chain reaction PCR as DNA replication in a test tube. So we have our DNA and all of the ingredients and some enzymes, and we put it in a machine, and we just let it run its course. In polymerase chain reaction, when we amplify the DNA, each strand of our target DNA, so we just start with one single strand, um, is going to serve as a template for DNA synthesis. Right? So just like in regular DNA replication in a cell, it was semi-conservative where we have one original strand that's a template to make a new strand. Right? So same thing with PCR. So our target DNA will be mixed with the nucleotides, the primers, um, the enzymes, DNA polymerase. So the primers will base pair with our template strands. So our DNA polymerase knows where to begin copying. We add in the bases, so the free bases are in the solution and available for that base pairing. After every cycle of PCR, we double our number of molecules. Right? So we start with one and now we have two. Right? So again showing our original parent strands, the blue and red strands were original ones. Right? So after one round of PCR now we have two strands. Right? But still semi-conservative we have our original red and blue still there. So we do another round right? and we double again. Then we have four right? and then eight, 16 and so on and so forth. So kind of an exponential amplification of the number of DNA molecules we can synthesize. Real-time PCR is a type of PCR used where the DNA will be tagged with a fluorescent dye. Um, so it's going to be measured after every cycle, so we get that real-time result. Reverse transcription PCR is where we use the enzyme reverse transcriptase, right? so it is an ACE, right? so it's transcription in reverse. So we're going to make DNA from mRNA. In normal transcription, right, so we go from DNA to mRNA to protein. Right? So protein synthesis, that central dogma of all biology, DNA is transcribed to RNA and translated to protein. Well, we can also go the reverse of that. So if we start with mRNA, because of the complementary base pair rule, we can work backwards to figure out what the original DNA sequence was.
So when we synthesize that DNA strand with the reverse transcriptase, now we can undergo regular DNA replication with DNA polymerase and make multiple copies of that with PCR. So remember in nature, plasmids can be transferred between closely related cells by conjugation where they have that sex pillus, right, so that mating bridge, so they have a physical connection to transfer those plasmids from cell to cell. DNA can also be inserted and recombined by transformation. Right? So this was where cells just take up naked DNA from the environment. Right? So one cell dies, right? lysis of the donor cell, so its DNA is now kind of floating in the environment. A recipient cell comes along and is able to take up that DNA and incorporate it into its own chromosome. Transduction was another natural mechanism for DNA recombination where we had viruses infect a host cell um, and in the process of packaging new bacteriophages some bacterial DNA kind of inadvertently gets packaged in a virus. So that new virus goes to infect another bacterial cell containing bacteria DNA that is able to recombine with our new host cell. So while these processes occur in nature they are very rare. So we can use transformation to insert foreign DNA into cells in the laboratory, but the cells typically have to be chemically treated first. Electroporation is where we use electrical current um, to kind of poke holes in the cell membrane and allow our gene or drug of interest to enter inside the cell. So the cell membrane will heal itself and now our new gene is inside and able to recombine with the host's DNA. Protoplast fusion is where we remove the cell walls, right, those thick, hard, protective cell walls from the bacteria, uh, but we leave the cell membrane. So we don't kill the cell, we just kind of tear down its outer wall. Um, so now all that's left is this more pliable, kind of squishy, lipid membrane. So remember, a bacterial cell without its cell wall is called a protoplast. Now these soft, pliable protoplasts are able to fuse their membranes together into one larger cell and their DNA can recombine. The cell will eventually grow a new cell wall right, and be able to reproduce and now pass on our recombined plasmid and chromosome. DNA can also be inserted into a cell using something called a gene gun. So this is quite literally what it sounds like. We shoot DNA directly through plant cell walls with DNA-coated heavy metal bullets. So this is typically just used with plant cells because they have those thick cellulose cell walls. Microinjection is a method for injecting DNA directly into animal cells using a micropipette. So a potential bonus question on our next exam. So the picture used as the example for microinjection in the lecture video, this is a picture of in vitro fertilization. So this is a human egg and they're holding onto it with this probe. Um, and then this is our microinjector, the micro needle with the sperm that's going to inject the father's DNA where they will recombine right, and form a new individual. So as we see, there are many ways to insert new DNA into a cell. But all will only survive if it's either on a self-replicating vector, um, so it's able to make copies and propagate through the generations, or it's directly incorporated into the new cell's chromosome by recombination. So we've been talking about genetic recombination and biotechnology, right, and shifting all these genes around, but how do microbiologists obtain specific genes? Well, one way is maintaining genomic libraries. So these are collections of clones containing different DNA fragments. So we can extract an organism's DNA and digest it with those restriction enzymes to produce gene fragments. Remember, restriction enzymes only cut specific segments. So we have three genes of interest that we want to separate and add to our library. So using our restriction enzymes, we have our three genes now separated. And we can then splice those genes into a plasmid or a phage right, virus vector. So now these vectors can be introduced into our bacterial cells. Right? So now we have a recombinant plasmid with the red gene, recombinant plasmid with the yellow gene, and one with the green gene. Right? So all isolated. 
right? So we insert each one into a different bacteria, right, to grow in separate cultures, right, and grow those clones. So a genomic library is just a collection of clones large enough to have at least one clone for every gene in the organism. Right? So you can think each book in this library is a bacteria or a virus strain that has a fragment of the genome. So all the books in the library together total comprise the entire genome of that organism. Cloning pure eukaryotic genes requires a few different steps because remember we have those exons and introns. We have that processing step of the RNA transcript before we can undergo translation. So remember the exons were your expressed or coding regions. The introns were the interrupting or um, just the non-coding regions. So to clone these pure eukaryotic genes and make complementary DNA, um, we have to use reverse transcriptase. So just like we saw with that reverse transcription PCR, the same enzyme, right? So we're going to work backwards from the RNA in order to figure out what the DNA sequence was. Right? But in order to do this, we can only use a copy of the gene with those introns removed. Right? So we still have to use that processing. Bacteria are able to remove eukaryotic introns on their own. So they won't be able to make the correct proteins. So we have to make this kind of artificial gene using that reverse transcriptase. Right, so here's our original gene. Right, we have our RNA transcript and then undergo that processing to remove the introns. And now we have our complete mRNA sequence. So now we isolate the mRNA and add reverse transcriptase to figure out what the complementary DNA strand would be. So then once we figure out our DNA strand, we get our first DNA strand, we no longer need the mRNA because we're not going to translate and make this protein right now. The mRNA will be digested by the enzyme. So now we have our original strand of DNA. We can add DNA polymerase right, and undergo typical DNA replication to make complementary strands. Synthetic DNA is made in vitro using DNA synthesis machines. Just what it sounds like, we are making synthetic DNA with a computer. So you basically type in your desired sequence of the nucleotides, right, your ATCG, um, and the machine will synthesize those DNA strands using our stored nucleotides right, and other necessary enzymes. So kind of like PCR, that DNA replication in a test tube, if you have all of the ingredients, you can make DNA. One drawback with this process, though, is you can only synthesize about 200 nucleotides at a time. So it usually requires several separate strands to be synthesized that later have to be linked together to form an entire gene. Another difficulty in the synthetic DNA is that you have to already know the sequence to know what to type into the machine. And if not, then you at least have to know the amino acid sequence and then work backward from there. So kind of like that reverse transcription, if we know the protein, right, maybe we can go backwards and see what the RNA was and then go backwards from that and see what the DNA was. However, another drawback with this mechanism um, is that degeneracy of the genetic code. So remember that degeneracy of the code just means that multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. Right. So if you're trying to work backward from the amino acid sequence, this degeneracy can make it difficult because which codon is the right one? Right. We have a leucine in this protein. So trying to figure out the mRNA sequence of this protein, right? there's six possibilities for that one codon. Right. So all of these codons would also have different DNA sequences. Because of these drawbacks, it's pretty rare to clone genes by synthesis only. A few exceptions are very well-known commercial products like insulin or interferons. So after cloning all of our cells and our genes and establishing our genomic libraries, we have to be able to select particular cells with specific genes that we're looking for. So out of millions of cells, only a handful might contain a desired gene. Colony hybridization is one mechanism we can use to select clones by using DNA probes. So remember, DNA probes are just short segments of single-stranded DNA that are complementary to a desired gene. 
and they're going to be tagged with a fluorescent dye or some type of molecular beacon or marker signal for detection. So if we know the genetic sequence of a particular gene, right, we're looking to see if it has that gene, we can also use this in identifying pathogens. So we know this particular bacteria, this pathogen has this particular gene. So we make a probe that's complementary to that gene. We treat the cells to release the DNA, right, and then we apply our probes to the sample. If that particular gene is present, then our probe will complementary base pair with it right, and give us that signal, letting us know it is present in the DNA sample. And we'll know which cells to select for purposes. Organisms commonly used for making gene products um, are E. coli for bacteria. Um, some advantages of using E. coli for our gene products is that it's easily grown and its genomics are very well known. Some disadvantages, though, is that it produces endotoxins because it is gram negative, right? So it has that lipopolysaccharide layer um, and it doesn't usually produce or secrete its protein products as easily. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a yeast, right, also used in uh, bread and beer making. Um, so it's easily grown and it has a larger genome than bacteria because it is a eukaryote. Um, and because it's a eukaryote, it can express eukaryotic genes more easily. Plant cells and whole plants can also be used to make certain gene products. One pro for plants is that they're eukaryote, so they can express our eukaryotic genes easily. Um, they're easily grown, large scale, and relatively low cost. So this example we have a vector, right, and it's going to insert DNA and recombine our leaf cells, right, so we can grow new plants with these antigenic fragments, right? so antigenic fragments from a pathogen, so maybe some surface proteins that would trigger an immune response. Right? So these carrots now produce these bacterial or viral surface proteins, so it kind of tricks your immune system into thinking you've been exposed. Right? So they're essentially edible vaccines. Mammal cells can also be used um, to make gene products. They can express eukaryotic genes easily. Um, and a lot of medical grade use products. Downside though is that they are harder to grow. So this is showing different types of productivity levels, different types of expression systems or organisms we can use um, to try to make a human interferon um, protein. Right? So normal human cells are T lymphocytes and your immune system produce this protein. So we can take the gene out of these cells for that protein and insert it into different vectors and expression systems. So depending on the type of gene we're trying to work with, right, different organisms would have different productivity levels. So in this example, because it's a human gene, um, the mouse and bacteria have the highest productivity levels. This is showing kind of comparison of speed and cost for different protein expression system. So generally in terms of efficiency and rate of growth, right, bacteria are going to be your best bet because they have that binary fission, as well as in terms of cost because they're microscopic. They don't take up a lot of space. They're easy to grow. These are tables showing some pharmaceutical products of recombinant DNA technology. So things like vaccines, uh, hormones, right? So remember from anatomy, erythropoietin, EPO, is used to stimulate red blood cell production, right? used in the treatment of anemia. One of the most valuable, well-known pharmaceutical products um, is human insulin, right? therapy for diabetes. Before DNA technology, insulin was obtained from the pancreases of slaughtered animals like sheep and pigs. So as you can imagine, this was very messy, expensive, and not as effective or safe as actual human insulin. So now with recombinant DNA technology, we can produce actual human insulin by using E. coli. So there are lots of therapeutic applications of this biotechnology, recombinant DNA technology. So things like human enzymes, other proteins, such as insulin, uh, other hormones, one type of therapeutic application is a subunit vaccine. So these are vaccines that are made from a portion or a subunit of a pathogen. 
So generally things like proteins um, on the cell membrane, so those antigens on the cell surface. So we can take the genes that code for these surface proteins um, and insert them in a genetically modified yeast cell and then grow those yeasts in large numbers. So because the vaccine only contains a portion of the protein and not the entire pathogen itself um, and the entire pathogen's genetic code, it can't cause infection. So the hepatitis B vaccine is commonly synthesized this way. So again, vaccines are all about kind of tricking your immune system into thinking you've been infected um, just enough so that they produce the antibodies. DNA vaccines can use non-pathogenic viruses to carry genes for a pathogen's antigens. So we take those surface proteins, those surface antigens from a pathogenic virus and we insert them into the chromosome of a non-pathogenic virus. So then you're exposed or infected with the harmless virus, but it's carrying the surface proteins or the gene for the surface protein. So it tricks your immune system into thinking you've been infected by pathogenic virus. You're going to produce those same antibodies. So if you are actually ever exposed to the real pathogen virus, you'll already have that protection. They're currently looking at DNA vaccines for trials against HIV and the flu. DNA vaccines are typically better than your traditional vaccines because, again, it's only using DNA from the infectious organism, whereas traditional vaccines use the actual organism, the actual virus itself. It's just a weakened form of it. Um, but this still has the risk of causing an infection, right, being fatal, whereas DNA vaccines avoid that risk. It's impossible to actually get infected and have that disease or infection because the entire organism and its entire genome is not present. Gene therapy can potentially replace defective or missing genes. It's currently being looked at for hemophilia treatment. Cells are removed from the patient, um, so we also have a vector virus that we kind of incapacitate so it can't reproduce. Right? And then we insert the correct gene for the clotting protein, the blood clotting protein into the virus um, and infect the host cells, the patient cells, with this altered virus. So now the correct gene right, will be inserted into the host cell and replace that defective gene. So now we have fixed these cells and we insert them back into the patient so now the patient can produce the correct clotting proteins. We can also use gene editing using what's called CRISPR to correct genetic mutations at specific locations. So CRISPR is basically just using specific restriction enzymes right, to repair um, and maybe insert or delete bases from a genetic sequence. So this may be a possible option in the future for sickle cell anemia. Right? So remember, sickle cell anemia is caused by a single point base mutation. So one letter has been misplaced, causes the overall change of the hemoglobin protein structure and function of the red blood cells. So maybe using CRISPR, we could correct that single letter mistake. Right? So then the patient could produce normal functioning hemoglobin. Gene silencing is a natural process in eukaryotes to help defend against viruses and transposons. So after transcription, RNAs called small interfering RNAs or siRNAs will bind to the mRNA. Right? So we make our transcript, right? So transcription. Next step would be translation, right? So making the protein. Well, the siRNAs are going to bind to the mRNA and prevent the ribosome from attaching and undergoing translation. They're also going to serve as signals for another enzyme called RISC or the RNA-induced silencing complex um, to degrade and break down the mRNA. So if we destroy the mRNA, no protein expression can occur. The Human Genome Project began in the 1990s and was completed in the early 2000s. In this project, they sequenced the entire human genome. 
So what they found were about 3 billion base pairs comprising about 25,000 genes. So here's another potential bonus question on your next exam. So one surprising finding in the Human Genome Project was that less than 2% of our genome actually codes for a functioning product or protein. So the other 98% includes things just like your RNA genes, uh, viral remnants, those short tandem repeats, uh, introns, right? telomeres, the chromosome ends, um, basically all just junk DNA that doesn't code for any protein. It doesn't really do anything. So bonus question, less than 2% of your genome actually encodes for a functioning protein. So the next step in research, next generation of research, is the Human Proteome Project. So they're planning to map out all of the proteins expressed by all types of human cells. Some other up-and-coming scientific applications of biotechnology is bioinformatics. So this is working to understand gene function via computer-assisted analysis, so kind of DNA in a digital format. Proteomics is the study of determining proteins expressed by a cell. So what type of proteins are expressed and how are they expressed? How are they regulated? Reverse genetics is the science of discovering gene function from a gene sequence. So forward genetic screens, your typical genetic screens, we have a phenotype or a cell of a certain shape or structure um, or function. So then we discover the gene that's underlying or causing this function or structure. Reverse genetic, we find a gene and then kind of work backwards to find out what its phenotype would be or what it would do we alter it. Southern blotting is the use of DNA probes to detect specific DNA fragments that are separated by gel electrophoresis. So this is commonly used to detect the presence of cystic fibrosis genes and other types of genetic testing. So how this works is we use those restriction enzymes, right, those specific cutting enzymes, um, to extract our gene of interest right, from our original DNA. These fragments are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms, which is a mouthful. So for short, they're called RIFLIPS. Right? So these RIFLIPS, or fragments, um, will then be separated by size by gel electrophoresis. So once we snip the DNA into different size pieces, right, we put it in the top of the gel and we apply an electric current. So this electric current is going to kind of magnetically draw these DNA fragments toward the bottom of the gel. But it's still a polymer matrix, right? So it's not completely liquid. So the smaller DNA fragments can kind of move through that matrix more quickly and reach the bottom, whereas the larger ones are going to get stuck and be slower moving through the gel. So then we can transfer those DNA bands, that band pattern, to a filter by blotting. So we just kind of dab it on the filter. Right? So we essentially just have a copy of this DNA fragment pattern right, on our filter that we can then wash with our DNA probes. So if that particular gene of interest is present, our DNA probe will find it and bind to it. So complementary base pair to the DNA fragment. And it will have that fluorescent tag or that kind of molecular beacon so we're able to detect where it is um, on the filter. So finally looking at some safety issues and ethics with this biotechnology. So Pandora's box has already been open. There's no going back now um, from what we've learned. So now going forward we just need to try to kind of mitigate and navigate this new road ahead. So one thing to think about is we need to avoid accidental release of these transgenic organisms into the environment, right? these genetically modified organisms. So a lot of these genetically modified crops or animals and microbes um, are genetically modified to give them some type of survival advantage. So if they were to get out into the natural environment, they could outcompete the native species um, and contribute to extinctions. Genetically modified crops must be safe for consumption and for the environment. So with the population of the world you know, increasing as it steadily is, 
we're not going to be able to feed everybody on the planet without genetic engineering. So we can genetically engineer crops to produce more yield, right, to be more pest resistant. So this is showing a non-genetically modified eggplant um, and a genetically modified one. So the Bt is a pesticide gene. Right? So if the bugs try to eat these genetically modified plants, they'll die. Right? So the plant is not affected. Whereas these, they have no protection against those pests right? ruining the crops. We also have to think about who will be able to have access to an individual's genetic information. So should corporations, should companies be able to patent DNA sequences and living cells and life? So where do we draw that line? Um, so one story in the news a few years ago was from Monsanto. So Monsanto has lots of genetically engineered crops, right? So one of those being corn. So some of their corn seeds from their crops, their genetically modified crops, um, were blown by the wind into another farmer's field. So those seeds grew on his land and you know, interbred with his corn. Um, Monsanto tried to sue the farmer, saying that they own right, the patent or they own the right to the genetics of that particular strain of corn that had just started growing on his property. So also with this technology, we could potentially eradicate a lot of diseases, genetic diseases and cancers, um, you know, if we manipulate the genes of embryos or babies before they're born, um, but then we get into designer baby territory. So where, is that ethical? Is that okay for parents to choose right, their children's traits? Or should it just be left up to nature? So there's a movie that kind of touches on this topic called Gattaca that's pretty interesting if you, you get a chance to watch it where there's different classes in society. So if you are you know, a genetically modified human, right? so you have been selected for all of these desirable traits, uh, then you're in the higher class of society. Whereas if you were just a natural born human right, with maybe some genetic defects, um, then you were a lower class citizen. But the DNA technology and you know, kind of the road it'll take in the future could lead to a situation like that. So where in, is the line? How do we kind of navigate and mitigate in the future with this technology? How far do we want to take this? But undoubtedly, the development of DNA technology has drastically changed science, agriculture, and healthcare. The field is only slightly more than 30 or so years old, so it's pretty difficult to predict really what the future holds, but it's likely that many of the treatments and the techniques and diagnostic methods that we talked about in this chapter will be replaced by even more powerful techniques within another 30 years.